just wanted to say uh, thank you to Pragmatic Leaders for having me. I'm very excited too. And uh, great community, great energy. People have already contacted me, contacted me and I'm looking forward to today. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Today, um, I'll be speaking a little bit about prioritization techniques. My name is Alfonso, like uh, Pijush introduced me. Thank you for that. Um, I will be sharing today a few experiences of mine as well as answering any questions you might have about today's topics or whatever you think uh, could, we could talk about at the end of today's presentation. Today we'll be going a little bit about, um, uh, we'll be speaking a little bit about myself first. Um, then we'll jump into why is it important for product managers to know how to prioritize? What is prioritization? Apart from a very difficult word to pronounce. Um, and then we'll jump into some techniques that you can use with other peers, with inside your same team, with your boss, which I think is very important. Um, and, uh, and hopefully these tools will help you uh, end up with a better product, right? Which is what we all want here. Um, by show of hands, just to understand um, if there are any roles that are not product managers here, I would love to see them in the, uh, in the chat if you can comment it. Thank you. So a little bit about, my, about myself. Um, that is not my most professional picture to start with, um, but it definitely fits the, the theme of the presentation. So like Piyush said, I've been working in product management for uh, 10 years this August, actually. It's my, it was my first role as a, the 10th anniversary of my first role as a product, um, associate product manager I was back then. Um, <clears throat> I've had the luck to work with mobile apps since BlackBerry was the number one app in downloads that we had. Um, and J2ME was number two, so Android and iOS were not even we're just starting. Um, I've had the luck to work in unicorns like Cabify in Spain, in Europe. I've been lucky to work with uh, blockchain and currently I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with a huge team which is Rakuten, which is uh, known as Jap the Japanese Amazon. It's a huge company here in Tokyo where I'm based at right now. Um, I founded two companies, one of them went bankrupt the other one I exited, so 50-50 there. Um, and also in my free time, I like to play bass and foosball with my friends. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get to it, right? And let's start with why prioritization, right? So um, in case it's not clear, um, why should a product manager care so much about prioritization? Is it really that important, you might ask yourself? And the answer is yes. Why? Through prioritization, a product manager like us or whoever is, is watching and in charge of doing prioritization provides focus, all right? So with, through uh, prioritizing a list of tasks, you as a product manager provide focus. And focus is one of the most important things anyone can bring into a team, right? Um, this is why you should be aware of this responsibility to start with, and then to ex you should be able to execute it uh, following the best standards that you can find. Hopefully today we'll uh, share a little bit of that. Um, we're all priority priority sizing, um, which means that if you want to be successful, if you want to be the one that beats the competition, you will definitely uh, need to be very focused. You know, you and your team will need to be very focused and through a correct prioritization, you can achieve that. So <clears throat> prioritization happens when you tell your developer to do this task over another. It happens when you build a roadmap, right? It happens when you tell somebody, no, we need to fix this bug now. It also happens, of course, when you and your stakeholders sit down and have a conversation about what the next new feature or what next year we're going to build or whatever, whatever related to your product should be in the future, right? We're not always aware of uh, when we are prioritizing, which is, which is pretty bad, actually. Um, the truth is prioritizing is hard. It's not always easily quantifiable, which is something we'll go over later, quantifiable. 
and it's not easy to inspect nor dissect, right? It's not like anybody will give you, oh, yeah, this is priority number 4B, right? You need to find that th for yourself. Um, and what's even worse, um, sometimes you need to do these exercises with a lot of people, with big groups, um, which that's uh, very difficult to manage when everyone is trying to get their way, right? Um, today we will review a few ways which uh, one can make this task easier, such a critical task easier for everyone. So, but before that, <clears throat> um, we all have different places to get to as companies, as teams. We all have different objectives. But um, before we actually start with the techniques, I want to let you know that there is actually a bit of a trick, if you will. Um, good prioritization, regardless of the team, regardless of the industry, regardless of the project, the company, whatever, the tech stack, or anything really, means uh, good prioritization wants to reach the same goal. So if you think about the, um, the sailors hundreds of years ago, we, and how they use the North Star to make sure they never got lost. This is the trick. This is the North Star of prioritization. And that is impact, right? Impact is the North Star of your prioritization as a product manager. Because um, affecting either the users, affecting the company, affecting your numbers, affecting your revenue is the only thing you should be worrying about. If you're building something and it's not meant to have impact, why are you even building it at all, right? So of course, um, we all want to make the most impact in our clients. We all want to make the most impact in our revenue, right? You want to grow out, to grow 100% your revenue by next month, let's say. And so it is very important that you know if you're causing impact or not, or not, because maybe sometimes you will need to work on, you know, clearing technical depth. And technical depth has no or little impact on the user, on the company, it has of course on the technical code, but um, even if you decide to do things that should not provide so much value or should not have so much impact on the end user, you at least should be aware of that, right? So that's why it should be a North Star. Okay, let's move forward. So, before we take a look at some of the things, uh, at some of the techniques, uh, there are a few things we need to know beforehand. Um, first of all, you should know, um, should take into account that you are not prioritizing for the 100% of your sprint, right? You are um, not reserving, you're not uh, changing a, or, or defining the entire, or allocating, which is a better word, your entire development muscle or design muscle or any kind of muscle that you have to, to bring products to uh, creation. You're not uh, uh, defining 100% of it. You already know how important your product, is, uh, your product is. You should already have a slot allocated for certain topics. For example, at least you should be allocating around 10% of your sprint or whatever, however you decide to work to solving bugs right, removing defects from the code. That's high priority. Therefore, you should always have a percentage defined to solve that. Um, and ideally, the same amount in technical depth or design depth or some other things that um, make your process a better process. So the first prioritization tip is always make room for the essential. If not, they will, be, they will uh, come and bite your back eventually. Out of scope, um, today we will not talk about how to come up with great ideas. Today we will not discuss, the, discuss workflows, we will not discuss agile methodologies. Um, these topics are very interesting by themselves and deserve their own uh, presentation. We will not cover KPIs, we will not cover OKRs, which are of course basic in understanding how you are impacting the product and what you need to do. Um, so please use the following prioritization techniques as you best see and as you best can fit in your day to day. So let's get to it. Let's start. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, prioritization, prior, prior techniques with your boss. Um, so your boss, your manager, whoever you depend on, might be one person, might be two. 
um, one person who you rather prioritize with rather than prioritize from is your boss, so to speak, right? So, so what this means, what does this mean, right? After all, your boss knows better than anyone in the organization what your job should do, what, you're, what job you're supposed to do, right? Um, input from your boss is crucial to make sure you understand the current state of, uh, of the priorities of all the internal players involved in your product or your company, right? Your boss is normally that bridge with upper management, with other peers, other teams in the same level, but uh, different across, right? So, so we said, um, how, how does uh, this work with your boss, right? So you will not prioritize directly with him, right? That's your job as a product manager. We said that's how you bring focus into the team. But um, in your regular meeting, through asking questions to him or her, you will need to understand, need to understand what is the company's situation, right? In large companies, you understand the priorities of your division or your group. For example, that's something that happens with me every day at Rakuten. It's such a large company. I need to understand like by divisions or by smaller areas. Um, if it's a startup, well, your entire, entire um, company per se. Um, and uh, you need to make sure you get this input from your manager, right? Make sure you do this with enough time to ask as many follow-up questions as you need with your manager. Um, you should, this should happen, of course, in a recurrent manner, and you should have something, for example, scheduled in the calendar, so right. So, okay, so I know I need to take input from my boss, and that's not always as clear, right? It, it also depends on the boss. So what kind of questions can I ask, right? So here are a few examples, right? So a good question I'd like to ask my boss is like, um, so which project cannot be delayed, right? Let's just assume some projects will be delayed because that's what happens. So boss, what project cannot be delayed? That's a good question. Another one is, um, will any of these following tasks block operations in any way? Will if we don't release this, will the marketing be blocked or will the, um, some other team that needs our infrastructure be blocked? Which one of these features that we're making make more money to our sales team, right? That's also super, extremely important. Um, and so these are a few questions I came up with. If, um, feel, please feel free to comment in the chat if you have used any questions like this to get crucial information from your manager. So I don't have much more recommendations when it comes regarding to the boss, right? Regarding to that need to prioritize with your boss other than make the best use of, of the time you have with your manager and one-on-one. -on -one. But I do think that being organized is that, uh, which means, you know, keeping notes of every meeting, every decision taking, et cetera, et cetera, that has always helped me. That picture is of my bullet journal uh, from 2017, actually. Um, I do this every year and I have every day, sorry, and I have been doing this ever since. Um, and this is where I track what happened every day following uh, the specific bullet journal note taking method. Uh, you can learn more about it at bulletjournal.com. I highly recommend it. Uh, I highly recommend that you take a look at it. And if you think your day could be a little bit less messy, please take a look at this because it has helped me greatly. It's part of uh, uh, what I do every day now. All right. That was the boss. That was your manager. Now let's talk about what you need to pay attention to when working with stakeholders, right? Which is people from other teams that have certain ownership or something to do, let's say, with your product. For example, the marketing team. So one thing you need to understand as a product manager is that after the launch of a product or service, sorry, there. If someone can help me by muting um, that, but um, so as you might know, or you should know uh, as a product manager or somebody involved in, in development of, of digital products, after the launch of a product or service, the job is not done there, right? You need to, um, well, not actually you, you need to maintain it, but other teams from other areas of the company get to work, right? And as a product manager, of course, you should be aware of this. 
Teams such as marketing and sales are just a few of the teams that will share responsibility on the success of the product you're managing, which is super important. Because of that, you should listen to them. And also you should take care of their needs, which I know sounds strange, but it's, it's true, right? Because it is you as the owner of the product that, you, that will make sure that all the best ideas from all the different areas inside the company are correctly represented in the roadmap, right? Nobody has the monopoly on good ideas. So, you know, let's not leave anybody out. And there's a, there's a, this is how I like to do it. I've been doing this in some way or another uh, since, yeah, since I pretty much started. Um, so let's review this uh, basic exercise that will help uh, you and your stakeholders be in sync, at least, you know, should know what's in each other's minds and, of course, hopefully prioritize. So normally this happens during a backlog prioritization meeting or a requirements gathering meeting, um, which is where you will use a tool such as this one. Um, there will be normally many high-level features that come up, many good ideas, bad ideas, and you will need to, to keep track of all of them, right? So you will need to, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you, uh, using a spreadsheet, you will agree on a few things. Sorry, can you confirm I'm audible? My computer is freezing up. I will, I will take that as a yes. Um, <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so anyway, using a spreadsheet, you, you will use it to agree on a couple of things. Oops, sorry. Well, I guess I can continue from there. Um, my computer is acting up a little bit. But basically, uh, you will make sure you have uh, room to, the, to measure how much impact that makes, that feature request makes. You will also make sure that you, have, um, you measure how much effort it will take to build such a feature. Um, you will agree on, on this on a quantifiable number from one to five. Also, there should be somebody from your technical team who uh, should uh, help you to say uh, how much effort it will take right, to develop. Or if you can do it, if you're a, a technical product manager, technical enough to, to do it, well, you should also write that down. Basically, what you will do here, and I will try to show it here before going into full screen again, is uh, you will see you can add them. You can multiply them if you have a lot of them and you're not sure. Um, but basically, by with those two numbers, you will get to a total number, which uh, I'm just going to call it the total today which it's actually quantifiable, it's a number. And by ordering, you literally will have what's most important and what's least important for your team. So, and, so, and why is this important? This, this uh, seems like, oh, a little bit ridiculous. Oh, it's, it's kind of super easy. And it is, but what happens is that this tool um, actually allows you to do something that is very hard to do with the groups, and we'll see it later in this, actually, the following slides, where it's uh, grabbing the ideas of many people which are not ordered, which are not easy to quantify, right? Because an idea cannot be quantified. And you can put that all together, and using a simple tool as a spreadsheet, you will actually end up with a number you can count and a number you can say, hey, but you said this was a six and this was a seven. Why are you asking me for a uh, high priority for this four task? Uh, so it's very important, right? Um, normally, people here put another column for priority. I do not do that. Um, there are many ways to do this exercise. If you are working, and this is just a recommendation with somebody you have a lot of friction with, with somebody because who doesn't see this approach as something helpful, I recommend that you go out and you say like, hey, listen, I'm gonna, you can give a few extra points because you know, your input is very important or because I feel you, your team is misrepresented or underrepresented in my roadmap. So it's important for me to, for that, that this happens. All right, let's move forward. So we've discussed your boss 
And we've discussed your stakeholders, right? So we've discussed up, and we discussed to your to the sides, your peers or your stakeholders. Now we're going to start discussing a little bit down and to the sides, right? Prioritizing with your team, managing the battle royale, which is which is funny, right? So. Um, as a PM, of course, you will always, uh, we said at the beginning, you will prioritize with your team almost every day, even without noticing you're most likely doing it now. Um, but yeah, I do want to say that <clears throat> when I say prioritizing with your team in some very specific moments, you should, it is your responsibility as a product manager to deliver uh, fully prioritized and validated with your peers, backlog, to your developers, designers, quality engineers, etc. Now, that doesn't mean that on day to day, you will not have to decide on some other things, right? For example, um, let's say you will be required to like fine tune, to slightly correct the curse almost every day. Normally during uh, daily rituals, such as your stand-up meeting, or such as, um, you know, your good morning in Slack, something like that. Um, for let, let, Let's give an example of a day-to-day -day prioritization that we might be doing and we might not be aware, right? So for example, um, let's say one day an engineer comes to you and tells you, hey, Alfonso, um, so it's Thursday, right? So all the week is almost over, the sprint is almost over. Uh, should I fix this bug? or should I uh, review this PR, which is crucial, it's also very important. Both things are very important, right? So what to do in, in moments like this where it's not so clear? Number one, it should be clear, <laughs> kind of. You should um, first go through the list of priorities in your head, check your notes, like I said earlier, but uh, most likely you will already know at that moment, at that question, what is the most urgent task out of those two. Um, it is important that you're transparent with your team about the priorities, about, um, especially about if, if something is urgent to other teams, you should let that know and let, that, let your team see that through you, right? Um, for example, in Trello or Jira, this is very easy to do with indicators or labels, use them, please. But most importantly, I think, when you're prioritizing with your team is to rely on them, right? You hire good people for moments like this, exactly. Um, when you're not sure about the best outcome could be, right, if I'm presented with that option, da -da -da, what I normally like to do is, if it's not super easy for me to grasp or I really don't have an option, I tell, or I'm busy or angry, I don't know, I tell my engineers or whoever is supposed to be, listen, um, I need X and Y to happen at whatever next week what can we do, right? Can we make it? Can you make this happen? Or what is your recommendation to me to make sure that this happens, right? Um, so, and also very important, just um, sharing the priorities, relying on your team to make important decisions with you, maintains them focused and motivated, right? Which is also um, one of the things you need to know how to do as a product manager or as a manager in general, right? as, a position, as a person in a position of certain management. Now, um, we're talking about working with your team. Let's make this more broad and say work with any team, right? Work with a large group of individuals, which is very difficult, um, right? If you're currently, if you're used to work in, uh, in big teams, you most certain already use tools such as planning poker, which is the image we see here, um, where you and your colleagues estimate invested efforts by yelling out a numerical value for a certain task. So like I said earlier, exercise like this allow you to take something that is hard to grasp, such as the input and ideas of, of a large number of people into something very easily quantifiable, such as a number from one to five, like we did in the exercise uh, a few minutes ago. And here, basically, what you're doing is, uh, like I said, converting qualitative opinions into quantitative judgments, right? This allows you to leave a meeting or to have a session, plan a session, 
with the very least, with uh, at least a few clear instructions, a few clear um, objectives that needs to be worked on as soon as possible, right? So, if you know, there are many ways on on of uh, doing exercises such as this one, where you take a number, where you take an idea and put an assign a number to it, and some other person does the same. You can average it out. There are many things. Uh, and many moments where you can do this, please take into account that when you're taking into account the opinions of many people, you'd rather be prepared. You should be prepared. It's not easy. It's not an easy task, right? So hopefully these uh, things that we've mentioned before uh, will help you out. Give me a second. All right. Now let's jump into prior techniques for one person projects. This is the last uh, part um, and I, I wanted to include it because even though it may not apply to our day to day um, work or operations, I think it will definitely apply to uh, yourself. I'm sure a lot of you are entrepreneurs. I'm sure a lot of you have projects, if not by yourself with somebody else, um, that's very close to you and, um, and right. So, uh, you need to make sure right when you're working on these projects where each investment as small as it is, is really important. You need to be, you need to make sure from the start that you're going in the right direction. Right. And what is the problem? We said with big teams, the problem is a lot of opinions that are hard to quantify, that are hard to, to make sure, okay, there's this is a number, this, we need this 11, we need this four. Um, the problem with small teams or with working with yourself um, is that it's, it's easy to lie to yourself about what is important, right? Maybe you don't want to build what is important because you want to build what is cool. Right? Maybe the project started as, as uh, I don't know, a front-end project that you wanted to, to test out new technologies rather than lay out foundation. That's okay. That's okay. I've done that myself <laughs> many times. Um, but there is a little trick, a little something that you can do to make sure you are building for impact. Um, and let's review it. So this is a short quick version of something that I'm sure a lot of you should know, um, which is called the Kano model, right? Well, we call this uh, must do, should do, worth it. Um, first of all, the Kano model, which ends up looking sort of like this one, but more complicated, um, was invented in the 80s by Noriaki Kano, an educator and expert uh, in the field of quality management, which is pretty cool back in the 80s. And he's also a professor, a professor here at the Tokyo University of Science. <clears throat> so basically, you start like this. If my computer allows, okay. Basically, okay. Before building anything, right? Use a chart like this to place the features, place them, place the features you're planning on launching. Right? It is important that this is your first step or among your first steps. In the Kano model which is the complicated version of this, right? You classify customer preferences into five categories. And those categories measure how necessary or attractive a feature or a product or a product line is for a customer. In this minimal version, we will just measure how something is needed, which would be impact in this case, and how much effort we will need to get it done, which is workload, right? Um, so we make our little chart here and you start by positioning inside this chart all the features that you want to make, all the ideas that you've had. You don't need to be very precise, which is what's cool about this tool. When we're saying, when we're speaking about large groups, it's all about being precise. In this case, when it's you and you're another partner or you are and two other partners only, no need to be precise. Um, and just think about each feature uh, that you think you need to build and then honestly, and that's the keyword, honestly put it where you think it belongs. All right, so that's what we're seeing there in the screen. A bunch of features um, put them along the impact and workload uh, axis. 
And give me a second here. I'm sorry about that. Um, basically, I will continue even though, okay, it's uh, freezing. Basically, what you need to do in this case is um, you can already start seeing, right? It's pretty obvious, which is, is what's great about this about this tool that it's pretty pretty obvious from just the, the, the first moments where you start placing features on top of the um, on top of the the chart what uh, what features are actually needed for example a feature I'm sorry that you cannot see it at the moment I'll make sure you see it but a feature that is right a feature uh, that is at the very right bottom part. What's that? That's a feature that costs us a lot to build and has very little impact. Why, why should we even build that, right? And then you have on the left top part, there you have tasks that are very easy to do and have a lot of impact. Hopefully you have a bunch of them there, which means that you, you can be really close to a very good product pretty fast. And there you can see in the bottom, in the upper left corner, you can see those tasks that are the tasks that you need to go get, right? Those are the tasks that um, will very easily or in a, just very shortly even, which is, which is fun, deliver a lot of impact, a lot of value to your customer or to your company, which is what you need to be doing. After a while, you just finish the lines, and you say in the green is what um, we must do and as soon as possible, apparently, since it has so much impact. At the bottom, we have what, what we should not really do at all, at all or what you should have a really good excuse to be building uh, that. And then in the yellow area as well, you know, then you can probably jump into one of the other prioritization techniques and see how uh, you would go about that. And that has been all. Thank you um, very much. I, I did want to save enough room for questions. I know there have been some questions uh, about this uh, and uh, I will make sure this is shared and available, of course, um, wherever it's needed. I already see that question. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I know we went very quickly over these techniques um, but I think uh, there's, there's small techniques. We're, we're not talking about, um, you know, high scale prioritization or we're not talking about, you know, what are the tools that we need to build or what are the main features or how can I come up with the best idea, right? A lot of our, our job as a product manager is ma managing the day to day, which is easier said than done. And I hope that these tasks or these little uh, exercises help you both in your day-to-day -day and in your own team uh, and for yourself. So um, thank you very much. Um, you say, uh, Prathima says, who decides the final number of each column? Is it via planning poker? How do you ensure it's on bias numbers? So that's a very good question. Let me just jump into this here. It's basically, uh, it's the addition of the impact and the effort, 5049, 3 and 3, 6, 1, 1, 2. Um, which this can be added or multiplied if you have a larger numbers or a lot of numbers. Multiplication normally helps, um, but um, this is basically how it is. And how do you make sure these two numbers are unbiased are a very good question. And that's where, um, for example, this is with your stakeholders, right? So this is where, with, let's say you're speaking to the sales team, to the sales manager, and he's asking you to, I don't know, uh, put advertisement placements on someone, right? Um, how do you make sure? Well, the impact is, is normally easier to define um, as uh, with money, right? So in this case that I'm saying advertisement, well, if one makes me $200,000 and the other one makes me $700,000, well, that's the one I should go. Um, and that's how you can make sure that uh, impact is not... Uh, very biased. Now, um, one thing you do take into account is that you will, like, it's hard to remove bias from 
definitions or estimations. For example, even in a tech estimation, that's why poker, planning poker exists, right? Prioritization of outputs versus outcomes, which one is helpful? Also difference of B2B and B2C products prioritization. Yeah, good question. So this is why I didn't want to get into like KPIs or OKRs or all that because it's such, it, which is are subjects that I love and they're very entertaining to me. Um, but um, now if you're asking me outputs versus outcomes, I definitely found like a lot of inner peace using OKRs in the companies that I've used them. I think they focusing on an outcome rather than on a number is very helpful. And I appreciate that. And thank you for your question. In my experience, I would say outcomes. And which one is helpful? Yeah, outcomes. Difference between B2B and B2C product prioritization. Right, so then, then what happens normally, or in my experience, what has happened in B2B companies versus in B2C, in B2C companies, normally myself, the product manager, we have a more, let's say, control over what needs to be done because we need to know the customer and the end customer is out there on the streets, represented probably inside the company by um, statistics that we own, you know, some panels, some K, not necessarily KPIs, but um, just numbers that we track from them. And on B2B, it's normally, I, I, at least in my experience, and I've worked in two, comp in two B2B products, normally the requirements come almost already given by our clients, right? So it's more on a, on a let's agree, on, on a feature set, which normally happens between the sales team or, and yourself, of course, you're also involved. Um, and that's the main difference I've, I've noticed there. Really the prioritization with B2B products come more with like, who wants this product? Who already bought this product? And, um, and when can we have it? Rather than in B2C, um, even in more agile companies, um, seeking to push a certain number or a certain outcome, right? Like, um, like uh, Avijit asked. Why have you added impact and effort? Does something like uh, not suit for these rights? So this was a very um, simple example. This is a very simple example. So um, my idea was to provide an insight in the case somebody doesn't know it. Um, I thought it was a, a good place to start. There definitely are a lot of ways WSJF, which is uh, what Pavel is recommending. Um, with value and effort on one side and also cost um, is very, very useful as well. Um, I, I have found out in my experience that, well, that whatever tool works for you and your team and your stakeholders, especially most of these questions are about that, um, is what you should use. Make up your own. That's what I, I've been doing. Could you please share the recording? Yes, we will. The team will. Can you share your experience on how to, you mitigate situation when prioritizing goals aren't met? First of all, um, there should, you should always be transparent, like I said in the presentation, both to your team regarding priorities, but also you should be transparent to your uh, stakeholders and your manager. And more than, rather than transparent, you should know how to manage their expectations. Managing expectations is a tool that's essential to any professional in general, but I'd say it's key to somebody that speaks to so many different people like us product managers, right? So um, when you cannot meet a goal, um, you know, you should go the, the, the highway, let's say, and say, admit to the mistake, make sure you find out what happened, not who messed up, Right, because that's not important. What's important is what happened and what can we make sure, uh, what can we do now to make sure that doesn't happen again, right? And my experience is just, I've done it many times. I mean, it's hard to, for projects to not get delayed, really. So I normally say, sorry, this is what happened. It won't happen again. <laughs> how, do you, how do I handle a high paid person opinions? 
keepers uh, when you know that the request is not in line with the market demand? Yeah, so very good question, actually. Um, I had um, a recent experience um, where I was working in a blockchain company and <clears throat> the CEO, who was like a very well-known figure too, in, in, in general in this, in this space and all that, um, I was the first product manager there, so I had to um, talk with this, like you said, high person, high paid person's opinion, this hippo, um, to make sure that uh, that that I, I manage his expectations to what I was going to do, and also um, I think one thing that is key when somebody like like this is asking you to do something that you know will be bad is that you become the most professional yourself, understand that this is work and say, hey, listen, this will be bad because of this, this, this. And it's my, if it gets to that point, which in my case it happened, I had to write an email and say like, listen, I've told you a couple of times that this will be bad. It's, it's you're the CEO and I can do it, but it's my professional, um, uh, obligation to tell you that what you're doing is going to hurt your product and you will probably lose around 33% of your daily active users because they do this and they do that and they do this, which is what I, what I said at that time. And I did convince him at that moment to, to, um, to not implement that change, which was, or request, which was a very bad one. It did hurt my relationship a little bit, but I don't blame myself on that. I think I did what I had to do. Okay, so Alex from Spain, hello. Um, he's asking, what do you think about dual track? So one track for discovery and another one for delivery. Um, so if you don't know what this means, this means like basically having parallel um, sprints for a team, one for uh, delivery, which means, you know, eating your vegetables, it means like doing what you need to do. And another one for discovery, which could be more for um, possibly launching new features, see how, if they stick, if they don't stick, how it affects the number, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> uh, if you can do it, right? There's nothing wrong about that. If they can and they let you do it, that's great. Just take, take into account that, mm, there will be a time where maybe you need to use the entire muscle of the team to work on, on delivery, right? So that's my opinion. Um, if not, it's been wonderful to be able to, to give this webinar at Pragmatic Leaders. Thank you very much, everyone, the 23 people that have joined. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with me. So thanks a lot, Alfonso, for taking out time and conducting such an insightful session for pragmatic leaders. I'm sure everyone would have some uh, takeaways from this session. And uh, yeah, we would love to have you once again for this session. I would love that. Uh, thank you, Vinay, Pratima, Atul. Thank you very much. Um, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm always open there for questions. I'm in the pragmatic leaders Slack. And uh, thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure.